All right, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to today's refined research lecture, the debate about Shakespearean authorship. I am your host, Rebecca Brothers. I'm the research and instructional services librarian here at the Salmon Library at the University of Alabama in Huntsville. Today, since we're getting so close to the anniversary of the Bard's death on April 23, which handily is all, uh, also suspected to be the, the day he was born, uh, some years before, um, we're gonna be talking about another of my research topics, my pet research topics, which is William Shakespeare, specifically why there's been such, such a long-lived hullabaloo about his true identity, very much in quotes. Um, so if you were here because you want to hear why Shakespeare was not actually Shakespeare, I'm sorry to disappoint you. Um, we're going to be talking about why that has been such a long-standing uh, belief, why that has been such a long-standing conversation in various circles. All right, so let's go to the next slide here. Okay, so for this presentation, my main source is going to be this book right here. Uh, this is Bill Bryson's biography of Shakespeare, Shakespeare, the World as Stage. It's an excellent book. If you do not have a copy on your bookshelf, it's very thin. Uh, and it just romps right through Shakespeare's life and death and legacy uh, and times and uh, impact and all the rest uh, of Shakespeare as the man and the myth. Uh, so great resource and the resource I am mainly using for today's conversation. We're going to start our narrative today in the year that Shakespeare died, 1616. Already it had not been a good year for the Shakespeare family. In February, William's daughter Judith married a man with a very poor reputation, uh, which was well deserved because within a month he was fined five shillings, which today would be about $260, for quote, unlawful fornication. Uh, and then the woman he was fined uh, for having relations with died giving birth to his child. The following month, William's sister Joan's husband, Thomas Hart, passed away, which left her a widow and in a very precarious situation. If that wasn't enough, six days after that, on April 23, 1616, William Shakespeare died, leaving the Shakespeare family embroiled in scandal, tragedy, and uncertainty. So that's uh, where our story begins here. Seven years later, 1623, uh, this volume was published. Shakespeare's friends John Hemmings and Henry Condell published this collection of 18 of his plays called Mr. William Shakespeare's Comedies, Histories, and Tragedies, or now uh, simply called The First Folio. This was not a project done on a whim. Plays weren't generally thought to be worthy of this kind of preservation. And folios are really big books. Uh, they're between 15 and 17 inches high and thus they're very expensive to print. A copy of the first folio bound in calfskin in 1623 would have cost about a pound, which in that day would have been enough money to keep a laborer fed for about two months. But it was a project that returned well on investment. More additions were quickly required in 1632, 1663, and 1685, respectively called the second, third, and fourth folios. There was another reason uh, for Hemings and Condell's efforts besides mere, um, you know, besides just being an effort in memory of their friend and colleague. And that is because the market had long seen the circulation of quartos. These are much smaller, cheaper books that claimed to be copies of Shakespeare's plays. Some were better than others. Uh, I think we have 21 that we know about now and nine are seen as good quartos or relatively faithful uh, copies of Shakespeare's plays, and the others are known as bad quartos, and this is one of the bad quartos. Um, these could be written by playgoers or actors or scribes who wrote down everything they could remember about a play, uh, either live at a performance, kind of scribbling down their copy, their version of shorthand, uh, or sometime afterward. Uh, if this sounds like not a great way, not a very accurate way to get a script of a play uh, written down, you would be right. <laughs> uh, we all know the beginning of Hamlet's soliloquy, to be or not to be, that is the question. Whether tis nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing end them. To die, to sleep, no more. 
and by a sleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to, tis a consummation devoutly to be wished. That is the version that we have from the first folio, and the only reason we have that version is because Hemings and Condell went through a variety of different sources, uh, some scribbled by Shakespeare's own hand, which have sadly been lost, um, some just kind of copied out for the actors who were playing Hamlet, uh, but they kind of consulted a variety of different sources and came up with this compilation of Hamlet's soliloquy that we know now, that we now know today uh, so well. But uh, one of those bad quartos that was circulating at the time, uh, this, is, this is what they remembered. This is what this particular playgoer remembered about this speech and wrote down and published. To be or not to be, I, there's the point. To die, to sleep, is that all? I all. No, to sleep, to dream. I marry. There it goes. For in that dream of death when we awake and born before an everlasting judge from whence no passenger ever returned. Um, which to me reads partly as kind of a half remembrance and half uh, original creation on the part of the writer. Um, so what Hemings and Condell were trying to do with their first folio is to banish these bad quartos, these unfaithful rep, uh, reproductions of Shakespeare's work to history and to supplant them with copies more true to William Shakespeare's original works. Unwittingly, by doing this, they have preserved about 15% of all the Elizabethan and Jacobian, uh, Jacobian plays we have today, which I think is a major reason why William Shakespeare has achieved the kind of mythic stature he has today. Yes, his plays are wonderful. They are imaginative. They are playful and somber by turns, but also Quite simply, his plays make up a large portion of the body of work we have from this time period. This is not to say his plays have been universally beloved over the past four centuries since his death. In his lifetime, playwrights uh, that we don't really know much about today, like Francis Beaumont, John Fletcher, Ben Johnson, William Cartwright, they were far more popular with the people. Uh, this gentleman here on the page is famed diarist Samuel Pepys. He saw a production of Romeo and Juliet in the 1650s, uh, just a few decades after Shakespeare died, and he called it, and I quote, the worst that ever I heard in my life. Uh, he quickly changed his mind, but that is only because he saw a play that he thought was worse than Romeo and Juliet, and that was A Midsummer Night's Dream, which he called, and I quote, the most insipid, ridiculous play that ever I saw in my life. Some of Shakespeare's plays slept on the page for hundreds of years before being revived on stage, like Troilus and Cressida, which wasn't produced again until 1898. Later editions of collections of his plays tried to boost readership by including other authors' works such as The Puritan Widow or The Birth of Merlin. Uh, both of these were included in collections of quote unquote Shakespeare's plays. You can see by these editions here, uh, they are attributed to W.S., William Shakespeare in turn, uh, but now we know that they were actually written by other authors. So here's our first gotcha moment of today's talk. Who wrote Shakespeare's plays, The Birth of Merlin and The Puritan Widow? Not Shakespeare. We once thought so, but now we know differently. In the early 1700s, scholars began to take an interest in Shakespeare as a person, uh, which is unfortunate that it was that late because that is about a century after he died. And by that point, all of his children had died and I believe his granddaughter Elizabeth had also died. Uh, so anyone who really knew Shakespeare as a person um, was no longer around for comment, uh, you know, for comments to biographers. Uh, but these scholars started digging into records to figure out what he wrote, when he wrote what, who he was, what he ate, who he paid, and what and when. Basically all the details of his life that they could uncover. Unfortunately, there were a lot of hiccups in this process. Uh, the first biographical sketch of Shakespeare, which appeared in 1709, asserted 11 facts about Shakespeare's life. Uh, of those 11 facts, eight were later disproved. Scholar Edmund Malone, starting in the 1760s, decided that Shakespeare didn't write Titus Andronicus uh, or any of the three parts of Henry VI uh, on the grounds that they were not very good and he didn't like them. So he just said, okay, I like Shakespeare. Shakespeare's work is good. Uh, Titus Andronicus is not good, therefore it is not Shakespeare. Uh, so here's our second gotcha of the day. Who wrote the anonymous 
uh, play Titus Andronicus. It was, of course, as we know now, William Shakespeare. This is Edmund Malone himself. Uh, he was a bit sticky-fingered, which did not help our modern efforts at Shakespearean scholarship. Uh, after many, many years, he was finally persuaded, partly by a lawsuit, to give back all of the plays and parish registers and other documents that he had borrowed. Uh, and when he finally gave them back, the original owners were horrified to find that Malone had done a bit of scrapbooking and cut out parts of documents that he wanted to keep, uh, many of them the signatures of various authors and playwrights that he wanted to keep in his personal collection. Um, Shakespearean scholars over the centuries have a habit of being a bit odd. Uh, in 1859, another researcher made, it, made, he made headlines when uh, it became clear that in order to support his arguments about Shakespeare's life and work, he had forged a bunch of documents. Uh, he was uh, frustrated that it was taking so long and so much effort to find actual evidence that he just said, you know what, I'm going to make my own, which is uh, is a method one could take. Uh, the same century saw the breathtaking vandalism wreaked by jo James Orchard Hallowell, after whose death authorities found 3,600 page fragments torn from over 800 rare books and manuscripts. Uh, among his targets were one of only two known quarto editions of Hamlet, now lost to history. For about 200 years after Shakespeare's death, all was quiet on the Shakespeare wasn't really Shakespeare front, with good reason. There were plenty of documents from his time identifying him as a playwright. There were none whatsoever hinting that someone else might be penning Hamlet or Juliet or Titania anonymously and letting a humble glove maker from Stratford take the credit. But in modern times, uh, Shakespearean scholarship has taken a turn, or seems to have taken a turn, uh, into conspiracy theories uh, running rampant. Was A Midsummer Night's Dream actually written by Sir Francis Bacon? Did Christopher Marlowe fake his own death and write The Merchant of Venice while hiding out in Kent? Was Romeo and Juliet actually penned by Elizabeth I? Uh, I'll let you... Hang on that suspenseful moment here while I switch slides. Uh, so all of these theories have their birth in 1811, when a woman named Delia Bacon, who is this lady here, uh, was born in a log cabin in Ohio. She was something of an eccentric, I say this lovingly, and she became convinced in adulthood that her namesake, Sir Francis Bacon, had actually written all of Shakespeare's plays. She took a ship to England in 1852. She stayed for four years, uh, writing 675 pages on her theory that were eventually published under the title, The Philosophy of the Plays of Shakespeare Unfolded. It was, um, to put it lightly, thinly researched. She declined offers to talk with Shakespearean scholars. She preferred to sit in Sir Francis Bacon's favorite locales and just kind of close her eyes and soak up the atmosphere, and that was her version of research. Uh, eventually, after the publication of her book, she returned to the U.S. and died in an institution in 1859, convinced that she was the Holy Ghost. At the time, her book was widely ridiculed. Uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne, the American author, had been persuaded to write a preface to it, uh, then later admitted after the backlash uh, that he hadn't actually read the book and swore in a letter to, quote, never be kind to anybody again as long as I live, which I think we can all relate to. Uh, but its core theory still resounded in some prominent voices at the time, including Mark Twain and Henry James. Uh, they were both fans of the uh, Baconian theory, as it became known. A few decades later, a lawyer named Ignatius Donnelly published a book called The Great Cryptogram, where he claimed Shakespeare's plays contained hidden messages, like this one he found, in quotes, in Henry IV, Part I. Uh, Cease Ill, or Cecil, uh, who he takes to mean William Cecil, Lord Berkeley, said that Marlowe, Marlowe, or Shakespeare, Shakespeare, never writ a word of them which, you know, you, you look at this and, oh, it's very convincing, very cryptic, uh, except that as another amateur cryptographer found, you can use exactly the same method to find this message. Master Will I Am Shakespeare writ the play and was engaged at the curtain, which indeed he did work at that particular London theater. 
Down but not out, more amateur cryptographers continued to weigh in. In 1910, an English gentleman named Sir Edwin Durning Lawrence published his book, Bacon is Shakespeare, uh, which, number one, really gave the game away on the cover page. You gotta, like, reel him in with some clickbait here, Edwin, but, you know. Uh, but he uh, used anagrams to support his main point, uh, including this nonsense word, which is found in the original copy of Love's Labor's Lost. Uh, let's get this a whirl. Honorifica bilitudinitatibus. We'll go with that. Uh, Durning Lawrence uh, did some back of the envelope math and found that these letters could be rearranged to read this phrase in Latin. E ludi f baconis nati tuiti orbi, uh, which is Latin for these plays, F. Bacon's offspring, are preserved for the, for the world. Uh, let me turn pages here as you digest that. So eventually, supporters of the Bacon is Shakespeare theory decided Bacon wasn't getting enough credit for composing two bodies of work, his own and Shakespeare's, and they started postulating that he was also responsible for writing the works of Christopher Marlowe, Thomas Kidd, Robert Greene, and John Liley, plus Edmund Spencer's Fairy Queen, Robert Burton's Anatomy of Melancholy, Montaigne's Essays, and the King James Version of the Bible. Um, the obvious flaw in this theory, of course, is that the man had to sleep sometime, and also he was busy enough writing his own works under his own name without inventing a half dozen pseudonyms to pen other bodies of work. There's also the small detail that he hated theater. Um, in one of his essays, he called it a frivolous and lightweight pastime. So the idea at the end of the day that a man who loathes theater uh, with this much vehemence could pen such, such wonderful plays as appeared under the name of William Shakespeare is ludicrous at best. Moving past the Baconian theory of Shakespeare's identity, we come to the end of the First World War. In 1918, a teacher in Northeast England postulated that Shakespeare's works were actually written by this gentleman. His name is Edward de Vere. He is the, or he was rather, uh, he is no longer with us, the 17th Earl of Oxford. He never did provide any evidence why such a boastful, arrogant man as Edward de Vere would publish some terrible plays and poems under his own name and then use a pen name for such beauties of the stage as Much Ado About Nothing. Uh, or, indeed, why he would write these plays for the Lord Chamberlain's men acting troupe, which were direct competitors to his own acting troupe, the Earl of Oxford's men. There's also the small detail that Edward de Vere died in 1604, 12 years before William Shakespeare, and years, years before many of Shakespeare's plays were inspired, much less written. Nevertheless, the, Oxfor the Oxfordian theory was very popular for a time, including among its proponents, Orson Welles and Sigmund Freud. Another unsatisfactorily dead candidate was Christopher Marlowe, writer of the classic plays Dr. Faustus, Tamburlaine, the Jew of Malta, and others. The theory goes that after Marlowe died, in quotes, I am putting that very reluctantly in quotes, uh, in 1593, he spent another 20 years hiding out and issuing plays under the name of Shakespeare. Uh, despite the lack of any evidence to support this, Westminster Abbey did eventually in 2002 add a question mark behind his death date on his monument in Poet's Corner. Um, I, I need a minute to digest that, but you know, that happened. <laughs> Another candidate uh, for the, uh, the person behind Shakespeare's plays was Mary Sidney, Countess of Pembroke, who was beautiful, educated, well-connected, and completely lacking any connection to Shakespeare's work. Uh, others say that Shakespeare's work is too voluminous and beautiful uh, and well-sourced to be a single effort. Uh, they say it was a collaborative effort with Bacon, Sidney, maybe Sir Walter Raleigh, and uh, various others producing his corpus of work in what was surely the best coordinated group project in history. But all of these assumptions rest on the theory that William Shakespeare of Stratford was an uneducated rube who could not possibly have written the masterpieces we know and love today. In reality, this was not the case. His father was an alderman in a large town. He underwent a strenuous education. And although he didn't attend university, neither did Ben Jonson, who was another consequential uh, intellectual writer of that age. 
Indeed, William Shakespeare's upbringing shows up in his work in ways that would be highly surprising from a playwright of noble blood. He mentions the tools of the glove maker's trade, like neat soil and greasy fells and skin bogets. He mentions colloquial names for dandelions. He knows what lute strings and bow strings are made of. Bill Bryson writes, in short, it is possible with a kind of selective squinting to endow the alternative claimants with the necessary time, talent, and motive for anonymity to write the plays of William Shakespeare. But what no one has ever produced is the tiniest particle of evidence to suggest that they actually did so. These people must have been incredibly gifted to create in their spare time the greatest literature ever produced in English in a voice patently not their own, in a manner so cunning that they fooled virtually everyone during their own lifetimes and for 400 years afterward. So uh, in conclusion, um, it, it, it is clear to me, you can draw your own conclusions, but it is clear to me uh, that all of these uh, attempts at unveiling William Shakespeare as not actually Shakespeare is number one a little bit tautological and number two not really rooted in fact and number three a little bit a little bit classist um, the man had the education he had the background he had the gifts he had the motive he had the opportunity uh, for writing all these beautiful works of literature that we know and love today so that is all I have for today, folks. Uh, I want to thank the Salmon Library at the University of Alabama in Huntsville for providing the time and venue for today's refined research lecture. And thank you to all of you in the audience for your time and attention today. Stay tuned for our next live stream event on uh, Friday, April 22, an Earth Day special titled How to Research Climate Change, coming to you from my colleague, Doug Bolden live streamed at 2 p.m. Central Time. We have a, sh a short survey here, if you would be so kind as to uh, uh, go ahead and uh, type that URL into your browser. It is case sensitive. Um, so go ahead and type in that, that survey link there into your browser. Take a short survey um, about today's presentation. And I'll be hanging around for a minute longer to um, yeah, answer any questions that we have uh, and go from there. So thank you so much uh, for your attention today and for attending. Here we go. I see, what is our, uh, oh, we've got six watching right now. That's exciting. Okay. So I'll go ahead and watch for any questions in the chat. Go ahead and fill out that survey if you will. And thank you very much for your attention.